I can use this? Yeah. Okay, perfect. Okay, hello everybody. Uh, so this is the, the last talk and we don't have many times and we're gonna get philosophical here, so bear with me. I thank uh, the previous talkers because uh, we have talked about phenomenology, we have talked about subjective experience and I think those are very important uh, issues that we don't take care enough um, in psychedelic research and actually it's very interesting how we try to f see how things arise in our mind without knowing what these things are, right? Um, so I work, I work in a treatment assistant depression program in my hospital. So we, we get uh, refers uh, patients uh, from, from all over Catalonia that don't respond to conventional treatments and that have been depressed uh, for a lot of time. And what I noticed um, is that one of the core symptoms that all of these patients have at that even persist after we have uh, taken care of other symptoms such as anhedonia or the difficulties uh, for concentration are uh, persistent beliefs, persistent negative beliefs uh, that uh, affect themselves and that affect the world. And, and they often act in, in ways that further reinforce these beliefs. So I, I started to question how these beliefs come to be and what, what underlies them, right? Um, and one of the main things that I notice is that most of them, they are related in, uh, to themselves and to the world in a first-person fashion, right? Uh, I want to die. I cannot enjoy things as I used to be. I don't have any hope in the future. I will never stop suffering. I don't deserve to be loved. I will never be happy again. 20% of the people in the world will be depressed. So maybe some of you have had these beliefs in the past or will, hopefully not. <laughs> So uh, what, what is I? What is, uh, what is the I that my patients and all of us refer to when, when, when they express these beliefs, right? Um, so when I think about myself, about how, how I came to be, I, I draw this, this story, this causal history, right? That links to, to the past miss, right? Um, so I, I tell myself that this, this, this child and this baby, they are, they are my, myself. And that through, through the years, there's, there's this thing that has been always the same. That's what Kant would call the transcendental ego self, right? Something that doesn't change, something that uh, is immutable through time since when we are born till we die. But if it doesn't change, how can it relate to the world? How can it enact change in the world and be influenced by it? How can it learn, right? Um, uh, also, it, it is difficult to imagine that this child and this, and this baby will have the same emotions, that same beliefs, the same behaviors that I have today, which is, uh, which is good, of course, because I have learned, I have grown from, from these, these states. Um, however, we, we grasp this, this transcendental self, right, to this ego. We try to protect it, we try to, to defend it against possible harms. And when something we think is going to harm this, this ima image of ourselves, we try to evade it, we try to run for it, from it. And this is uh, where Buddhism comes uh, into play and why I am gonna expl explain you why I find it very useful to, to assess the, 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 the phenomenology of this, this, uh, this experience. So as most of you know probably, Siddhartha Gautama was a prince that uh, lived in India 2,500 years ago. And uh, he noticed that this necessity to protect the ego, this fear for the future, this grasping uh, conducted to suffering. So driven by, by curiosity and by, by compassion, he went on a quest to try to understand it and try to, to find an element to that suffering. Uh, and since the ego is supposed to be inside of us, right? We, we, all, we always think that it's, it's inside of us, maybe behind our eyes or something like that because that's our perspective. Um, he decided to explore himself and he developed this uh, phenomenological or technological system to explore the, the, the first person experience that we probably know today as meditation. And after a well-known history of uh, self-exploration, he came up with which are known as the four truths, which might seem a little spiritual, but I will tell you now how they relate to modern scientific <coughs> theories. Namely, he, said, he stated that all compounding things are impermanent, all emotions are pain, and it's important to bear into mind that pain in Buddhism terminology refers to a lack of liberty. 
all things have no inherent existence and nirvana is beyond concepts. We're not gonna talk about nirvana today because we only have 15 minutes, but the previous truths uh, are pretty relevant for my talk. So um, to me, the most fundamental uh, concept in this truth one rediscovered also by the phenomenological tradition in Western philosophy in the 20th century, is the fact that reality is not as we perceive it. Uh, it's just a set of compounded things. Um, and w we put our beliefs into reality, and that is the reality that we perceive how it comes to be. For example, as Antonio Machado beautifully wrote in this, in this poem, uh, a path doesn't exist on its own. Uh, when we see a path, we see it because we know uh, its affordance. We know it's, it's used for walking, right? Um, so it wouldn't exist without our server, without anybody to walk through it. And conversely, which is less intuitively, the observer arises when it observes things, uh, with external sensation or internal ones, such as thoughts, because in Buddhism uh, philosophy and phenomenology, uh, the mind is the sixth sense, uh, which perceives thoughts in the same way that uh, the view perceives visual stimuli. Um, this is in contrast with the traditional stance of uh, naturalistic science, right, which states that there is an objective reality that, that exists um, outside of the observer and the, that it's independent of the server, right, and it doesn't care what you do, the reality is always going to be there. If we all die, the reality is always going to be there. Um, however, uh, even basic science such as physics are uh, currently um, challenging this notion as well. So. Um, if the observer only appears when it observes through a codependent process, right, if all things are codependent, uh, then it doesn't exist by itself. There is no path without a walker, but there is also no uh, walker without a path. So um, Buddhist phenomenology proposes that consciousness is just one of the five aggregates, and this, this comes from this uh, exploration through meditation of what happens when we ourselves ourselves uh, these aggregates that uh, are called skandhas that arise from this codependency between reality and ourselves and the world. So um, as all things in the world, they have no inherent existence. They, they come and they go, right? Uh, because they cannot be in, on their own. We, we cannot experience ourselves without um, a framework, right? Before a reference. Um, however, uh, we believe we instinctively believe that they have an instinct ontology, right? We grasp to them because we believe them to be us. These, these perceptions, these beliefs, these, these dispositional formations, we think that they are us, that they won't change, and if they change, we will be harmed, we, we will cease to be us. That's why we struggle to protect them. Um, as Juan Ramón Jiménez said here, I, I really love to put poems as example. Uh, when we turn to ourselves to try to find, this is, uh, these things that we believe we are, uh, this transcendental ego that we mentioned before, we find that um, all of these sensations, all of these beliefs, all of these behaviors are fleeting and impermanent. And to convince you a little bit more, I'm gonna talk also about science, about this, this model that probably most of you know, the, the relaxed uh, beliefs under psychedelics model proposed by Carl Harris and Carl Friston that has reached a similar con uh, conclusion using uh, psychedelic research. Um, it proposes that we hold beliefs in a hierarchical way, in a hierarchical fashion, um, that modulate the way we perceive the world by giving more salience to certain stimuli over other stimuli. Um, we, we develop these preferences, these beliefs, in, a, uh, in order to create predictive model models that uh, might help us to predict the world, what is going to happen, and hence protect ourselves, anticipate ourselves, maintain our existence, right? Um, so very high beliefs are uh, very resistant to change in the external world. Uh, and they might as well shape reality in a way that might be incorrect or even harmful for us, despite being told otherwise by the, by the external environment. So when we take psychedelics, uh, these beliefs become more malleable, more flexible, and the brain can pay attention to new stimuli that was not given salience before, uh, allowing for increased flexibility. This allows us to, go, to get closer to the world as it is and allows for meaningful self-actualization to change these models that might harm ourselves. 
And this is not new, actually. That's why I think dialogue between different sciences and epistemologies is relevant. This is very similar to what uh, cognitive behavioral therapies were saying all along for a lot of decades. Um, our thoughts and feelings are reinforced by our behaviors, which reinforce the thoughts and feelings in sort of a fashion loop. Um, and this is uh, in order to reinforce some core beliefs that we hold about ourselves and about the world. So these models, in turn, have a resemblance to an even older uh, model, which is the Wheel of Life, proposed by Buddhism as well, um, in which our behaviors are caused by our beliefs, desires, and emotion, and they in turn perpetuate these tendencies. Because we, uh, another core uh, truth from Buddhism, which is shared by science as well, is that we are bound by causality. Everything has a causa, uh, has a cause, right? Um, however, the diagnosis and the treatment that Buddhism proposes is a little different. Um, so, we, if we are aware that these behaviors come from this grasping, this need for protection uh, to something that actually doesn't exist, that is a construct, um, we can liberate ourselves from this causal will and end the suffering that arises from this grasping, this desperate uh, protection of something that is nowhere to be found. So, when we integrate those perspectives, we can reframe psychedelics as power to, for tools to, to relax our mental disposition, this necessity to hold onto an ego, and perhaps even to realize that there is no such thing as an ego in the first place, um, to be protected and catered for. In this way, we can gain perspective over um, the causes of our suffering and uh, enact a more meaningful relationship uh, with ourselves and, and the world. And I'd like to conclude the talk with uh, the scene that gave name to it, uh, which is from Matrix. I hope that all of you have seen it as well. And this actually is related to a famous um, Buddhist history, uh, the history of Milarepa, uh, which was a Buddhist priest that hid uh, in a very tiny, in a very tiny horn uh, when there was a storm, and he told another uh, monk, "There is no horn. I can I can do whatever I want." Um, so some people interpret it uh, in the most literal way, suggesting that there is no actual reality, there's not a reality, so we can gain powers over this kind of virtual reality, right? This is the path maybe some postmodernism or, or New Age ways has gone. Um, so we can even change the external reality. Uh, but in truth, when this character in the movie mentions that there is no spoon, he's referring to the truth that uh, the spoon is just a concept, it's a codependent object that, is, uh, that exists not only because of the spoon itself, but because how we perceive the spoon, because our beliefs about the spoon. So if we are aware of how our beliefs and those of depressed patients uh, make them suffer, and how they arise not only from the world, but from the way um, that we react and sense, and sense this world that might seem hostile, but this this uh, perception, this uh, impression also comes from these beliefs. Uh, we are in a better position to, to free ourselves from this influence and to shape ourselves in the way we deem more meaningful and have a healthier relationship toward the world and toward ourselves. Thank you. <laughs> Amazing presentation, Oscar. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have one burning question I see already, so we will take that. <laughs> Hello. Thank you for this presentation, first of all. Um, why you, I felt now, focused mostly on how the experiences we made are sort of that we attach now to our sense of self are happening within consciousness. I would say that you could also that maybe some people, and I, I would say there are many people who uh, practiced a lot um, just observing the subjective experience that come to the conclusion that even the brain is created by consciousness and not vice versa. And I've, I feel that, I would say, in this room or in the scientific community, it's usually the assumption is, even though we speak mostly of neural correlates, is that we say that the brain creates consciousness. And I was wondering, because you did probably much more research on Buddhist um, experiences and maybe also other traditions that 
um, investigate subjective experience, if you found some studies that found out about people who practiced action or who, yeah, who have more this other metaphysical view? And if yes, what should science do to not sort of, because there is, according to Chalmers and maybe other people, there's not yet a proof as to whether consciousness comes before or after our brain, basically. How can we keep this open mind in the scientific community? Is the, 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 yeah, the hard problem of consciousness, right? That, that's a very hard problem. <laughs> um, so uh, the, the, the theory that I endorse the most is the uh, embodied mind theory by, by Varela, which uh, um, started, he, he had this, this beautiful book that I recommend you, which, which is called The Embodied Mind. It was written in the 80s, but uh, it has, uh, you know, opened a whole school. And what, what he's, it actually grows from this tradition, from Buddhism. Uh, actually, it was written by him and two women who were uh, proficient in uh, Buddhism studies. He was a, a neuroscientific. And what he proposes is that mind doesn't arise from the brain, the brain. It arises from the interface, the relationship between the body, the organism, and the environment, right? Um, we, are, we are attuned to the environment. So uh, in this sense, um, I, I think that's one of the, one of the big uh, problems, and that's what I mentioned, uh, I mentioned in the beginning of the, of the talk. When, when as scientists, we, we engage in researching these very complex things, these things that sometimes are ineffable, right? That, that transcend language. We lack uh, a methodology to really uh, evaluate it outside of a paradigm that is naturalistic and that focuses on the biological emergence of mind from the brain. And I don't have an answer to the hard problem because uh, that would grant me maybe a Nobel Prize or something, I don't know. <laughs> but, but I think um, we have techniques to assess uh, from the experience what happens instead of using or maybe mixing with uh, more scientific tools. And I think meditation is a very, very powerful technology and very uh, interesting technology to explore this experience from a first-person perspective and to combine it with technologies that explore these experiences from a third-person perspective, such as um, neuroimaging or, or psychometric scales, for example. 